Yep, I'm ready to go. Okay, great. All right, great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Kevin Hassel. I'm with New Jersey's Department of Environmental Protection. Um, I'm also chair of the Mid-Atlantic Committee on the Ocean. Um, so, you know, great. It's, it's Ocean Month, so thanks, everyone, for joining Mid-Atlantic Fish Habitat is changing. Um, you know, I think this is a really important topic. Um, you know, this this webinar series builds off of last month's Mid-Atlantic Ocean Forum that we had, um, basically in, in ways that we can leverage uh, getting more information out to folks. Um, we heard a lot from our stakeholders about how important understanding, you know, just ocean habitat in general is, how important fisheries habitat is, and also understanding how those habitats and, and other ocean conditions are changing uh, with climate change and other issues. Um, you know, it's definitely a topic that's been in the mind of, of resource managers for a long time. Um, there's a lot of great people working in this space, and so they've been grappling with this issue. And, and so today I think we're going to hear some really great information from folks. Um, and with that, I want to hand it over to Jessica Coakley at the uh, Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council and part of the, the MAKO steering committee uh, for this. Uh, she did a great job pulling together this panelist and, and these talks. I think uh, um, you know, we'll learn a lot today. So, Jessica. Yeah, thanks for that introduction, Kevin. Um, yeah, I'm really excited today we've brought together some researchers that are doing work that's contributing to this body of knowledge examining fish species and uh, fish habitat shifts, and we really hope you enjoy taking a deep dive into today's subject. So we're going to start out today with a series of speed talks from each of our presenters. They're going to run about 10 minutes each, and then we're going to have some opportunity um, for discussion amongst our presenters and hopefully some time for some Q&A at the end of this. Um, so our first speaker is going to be Vince Saba. He's a research fisheries biologist in the Ecosystem Dynamics and Assessment Branch of the NOAA Northeast Fisheries Science Center, um, based out of Princeton at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. And his research is really geared to aiding the process of moving us towards ecosystem-based fisheries management under changing climate conditions. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and uh, pull up our talk. And then, um, Vince, if you can unmute yourself, I think we'll be ready to go. Uh, just say next slide when you're okay, ready. Jeff. Oops, okay, Jeff. Okay, thank down? you. And can you hear me okay still? Is there any problems hearing me? I can hear you well. Okay, all right, great. Okay, uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I'll try to keep this to 10 minutes. I know we have a few other presenters. Um, so. Uh, as Jessica said, my name is Vince Saba. I work for the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, um, but I sit at the NOAA Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, uh, which is part of NOAA OAR, located in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, before I go over some of the habitat modeling that we've been doing at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, um, I just want to go over a few of the observations. Um, and so these three figures here are from our latest State of the Ecosystem report. Uh, which were just presented to the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council and the New England Fisheries Management Council. Um, we provide two reports each year, uh, one focused on the Mid-Atlantic and the other focused on the Gulf of Maine and Georgia's bank. And so these three panels here are coming from the report focused on the Mid-Atlantic site. Um, and so in terms of ocean temperature, there, there are various ways we can assess changes in how um, the ocean uh, how the ocean has been changing over the last few decades. And a new way we've been doing this, as opposed to just simply looking at changes in sea surface temperature or bottom temperature, um, for the Mid-Atlantic Bight, we've been looking at both the cold pool index and also uh, marine heat wave intensity. So the, the top two panels are the marine heat wave index. This comes from Alistair Hobday's uh, 2016 published work. And essentially, this index uses SST, sea surface temperature, uh, measured by satellites. These are daily measurements at about a 25 kilometer uh, horizontal resolution in the ocean. And so as you can see from the uh, early 80s up until present, the maximum intensity of these marine heat waves in the Mid-Atlantic Bight uh, and also their cumulative intensity, which gives you a sense of duration, has been increasing. So the ocean is not only getting warmer, but the duration of these marine heat waves has been becoming, has, has been getting longer. Um, over the last few decades. And we see similar results uh, further north in Georgia's Bank and the Gulf of Maine. 
Uh, we can also look at the cold pool index. Uh, so the cold pool is the seasonally derived body of, of, of autumn ocean water, which stands at about eight degrees centigrade. Uh, especially, it's especially evident in the summer uh, when the water column is, is highly stratified. And we've been taking measurements of the cold pool uh, for quite a while now using our survey data. And we found that over the last 30 years or so, the cold pool is not only getting warmer, which is shown in this bottom figure, but the extent of it is also getting smaller. So the cold pool is in fact shrinking in the mid-Atlantic. Next slide, please. Uh, if you could just click that animation, so thank you. So hopefully you can see that animation running. So in order to assess climate change impacts on uh, fish habitat, at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, we've been heavily relying on a high resolution global climate model. Uh, it's NOAA GFDL CM 2.6. So on the left panel here, you can see daily sea surface temperature running in the model uh, for the North Atlantic. And this is at a 10 kilometer ocean resolution. So this is what we're currently using for our fish habitat modeling. And you can see it does a really good job with getting the Gulf Stream. Um, there are some biases in the northern zone. But for the most part, it's resolving mesoscale eddies just due to its simply high horizontal resolution. Uh, if you look to the right, this is your standard global climate model, which is about 100 kilometer ocean resolution. And you can see that the Gulf Stream essentially overshoots uh, Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, extends into the southern Gulf of Maine and George's Bank, which is obviously unrealistic. And so you can bias correct these coarser models to the right, but uh, we felt it was more appropriate to use a global climate model that is actually resolving shelf dynamics when we're talking about changes in fish habitat. So we've been mostly focused on this model on the left. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of projections from this high-res model, the bottom right panel here is CM 2.6, which is the high-res model. And these other three models here are coarser models. So just to the left of it is a 25-kilometer ocean model, and then the upper two are 100-kilometer ocean models, one with a higher-res atmosphere. And what you can see is that as you increase the resolution of these global climate models in the ocean, the, the projected warming under climate change, in this case it's a doubling of atmospheric CO2, goes from uniform in this upper panel to non-uniform in this bottom right panel. And you can see these red zones and yellow zones here in the Gulf of Maine and George's Bank, where more Gulf Stream water is coming into the U.S. Northeast Shelf and then eventually circulates south into the Mid-Atlantic Bight. So the, the cause of this enhanced warming in the high-res model is both due to anthropogenic um, emissions of, uh, of, of greenhouse gases, but also this change in regional circulation, which the model seems to be picking up. Where, where more Gulf Stream water is now entering the Gulf of Maine than the earlier part of the run. And this is actually something we're seeing today in the Gulf of Maine. We're getting more Gulf Stream water and less Labrador, which is the colder water coming from the north, into the Gulf of Maine. Next slide, please. Hey, Vince, Car this is Carl, real, uh, real fast. Uh, yeah. We're getting some uh, people who are saying in the chat that they're having trouble hearing. If you could just speak up or, uh, to, to the extent that you can to you know, make it louder. Yeah, I'm, I'm speaking pretty, I mean, I think I'm speaking loud. Maybe it's my microphone. Um, Jessica, can you hear yeah. me okay? I, I can hear you um, clearly, but I'm on the conference line and not using the computer audio, so. Oh, okay, maybe, Every, maybe everybody's that's the set issue. Everybody's a little different, so just the best you can. Okay, yeah, I, I apologize. I, I don't know what else I could do. Um, Okay, so let me continue here. So the, um, the, species, so the, the species distribution model that we've been doing in the shelf has been based on, at least within the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, this, this higher res model. And so some of our earlier work, we have looked at general additive models, GAMs, and we're using our survey data to train these fish habitat models from our spring and fall uh, bottom trawl survey. And so here, this is a paper from Kleisner et al. in 2017. Um, this is basically showing changes in habitat, available habitat for Atlantic cod, which is a cold water species. And so since our survey began in the 60s, going through a more contemporary period, there's been a decrease in the number of cod we've been catching in our survey, which you know, we believe is due to both changes in ocean conditions, but also synergistic effects of fishing mortality. And then as we project this habitat into the future, you can see that there's virtually no cod habitat left after uh, atmospheric CO2 doubles at the end of the run. Next slide, please. And so we can put this in the context of fisheries. And so when we look at different species um, throughout the U.S. Northeast, 
uh, in terms of value. In this case, we're showing American lobster being uh, the most valuable relative to summer flounder and Atlantic croaker, whereas croaker is the least valuable. And so as we look at these habitat projections, we can look at the distant support where the center of biomass of these species are projected to be uh, 50 to 100 years into the future. And you can see that some of these ports um, uh, the, the, are closer to these species uh, today, which are the open circles, and then the closed circles are where they're projected to be uh, 50 to 80 years into the future. And so some of these ports will be closer to more valuable species like lobster or summer flounder. Other ports will uh, be further away from the center of biomass, which of course has implications for fuel costs, uh, potential gear changes if target species are going to change, and of course fishery management plans. Um, but the main point here is that these projections only account for changes in the ocean in terms of temperature, um, and I'll show some other examples of salinity changes. We're not accounting for fishery mortality change, and we're now looking at species interactions. Next slide, please. And so some of our more recent work uh, using the high-res model, we're going beyond temperature, and we're starting to look at other variables. So in this particular paper from McHenry et al., we looked at the synergistic impact of changing ocean temperature, salinity. We also looked at sea surface height. And we also looked at bottom temperature and bottom salinity. Um, and we also measured habitat 12 months of the year as opposed to just the fall and spring when our survey runs because we use fishery observer data, so fishery dependent data, to train these habitat models for over 100 marine taxa in the US Northeast. And so what we found was that this is an example for black sea bass. On the left panel here, this is a black sea bass model, a habitat model that only uses, uh, excuse me, on the far left, it uses both temperature, salinity, and sea surface height as model variables. In the middle panel, this is a black sea bass habitat model that only uses temperature. And you can see, the, and these are projections into the future, so you can see the two are very different um, in terms of where we're projecting black sea bass habitat. And we actually found that salinity had a substantial role in um, black sea bass uh, habitat, the, the strength of the variable in terms of predicting black sea bass habitat. And it doesn't mean that it's a direct response of the species. It could be a proxy for something else like primary production, regional ocean circulation, so on and so forth. Um, and you can actually go to this website here, this R Shiny app, to actually look at these projections for all of our marine taxa in our survey to see how they look for projections, but also in terms of how they look when they, the models only use temperature versus using other variables. Next slide, please. Um, we've also done some work with habitat um, ensemble modeling. Uh, this is a recent paper published this year where we looked at sea scallops and American lobster, um, uh, with sea scallops being obviously more relevant to the mid-Atlantic. And so what we did here was we used, uh, not only did we look at variables beyond temperature and using the high-res model, but we also used ensemble habitat modeling from the uh, R software package Biomod 2. And so what we did, we looked at, we weighted multiple habitat models based on their performance in the contemporary period, and then each habitat model was weighted based on that performance. And so when we did our projection, those models that did better in the contemporary period received larger weights and um, were more inclusive in the ensemble mean than those models that didn't do so well. So this is a particular figure for sea scallop where the contemporary habitat is shown on the left, and then the changes in habitat are shown on the right. You can see in the blue areas, we're projecting substantial loss in sea scallop habitat throughout Georgia's banks and the mid-Atlantic. But a note of caution here is that we're only looking at ocean temperature and salinity. We did not look at changes in ocean acidification, which we know are important for scallops, nor did we look at changes in fishing and multi-species interaction like uh, predatory sea stars. Next slide. And so that habitat modeling would look something like this. This is uh, for American lobster. I know there's a lot going on here. But if you, you can see, each different color line is a different habitat model for lobster. And some of these models project increases in habitat. Some project decreases. But they're all weighted differently based on their performance in the contemporary period. And so the key to focus here is the, the key to, uh, component to focus on here is a solid black line, which is the ensemble habitat model mean which takes into account all those different weights that are uh, scored to each habitat model, which gives you your overall projection for American lobster habitat throughout its range. Next slide, please. OK, this is my last slide. And so this is a more recent paper that we published relevant to the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, this is for cobia, which are a popular uh, recreational fish. 
And I think, uh, you know, the most unique component of this study was that we, we trained the habitat models based on archival fish tagging data. So we use three-dimensional archival tagging data to inform uh, the habitat model for cobia, and then we projected into the future using the high-res model. And what you can see is that for this particular warm water fish, uh, habitat, this is for October in the Mid-Atlantic Bight in the South Atlantic or Southeast um, U.S., we're projecting that the uh, habitat of Kobe will increase as the ocean continues to warm uh, 60 to 80 years in the future. And uh, I'll stop there. Well, thank you, Vince. Um, yeah, that was really interesting. As I noted earlier, we'll have some opportunity for um, questions and discussion at the end. Um, our next speaker uh, that's up is going to be Rich Bell. Rich is a um, fishery scientist with the Nature Conservancy, where his work focuses on understanding the drivers of changes in fish populations. And many of his projects involve trying to understand the impact of climate variability on fish species and the potential for incorporating that variability into management. Um, are you ready to go, Rich? All set. Thank you. Take it away. All right. Wonderful. So thank you, and good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to present today. If you could hit the next slide. So I'm a fishery scientist with the Nature Conservancy, and our mission in general is to conserve the land and water on which all life depends. And so how we work in the marine environment, we have a few different strategies. And one of the most important ones is to work with stakeholders to try and improve the information upon which management decisions are made. And I think that aligns pretty well with this body uh, and leads us to a lot of interesting work, really getting out on fishing boats, collaborating with scientists, working with the agencies, council staff, management, uh, and we have numerous people that are connected uh, with Marco as well. Next slide. So many of you might have been present last month when Chris Bruce and Marta Rivera from the Nature Conservancy presented their work on distribution changes uh, of fish habitat in the mid-Atlantic. And this was a nice bit of trying to get some information, create some nice visualizations so that uh, the public could really take a look at what is happening on the water and really interacted with them by, for themselves. And of course, as soon as you start working with any kind of time series of data, uh, the climate really starts to come into the picture. And so this has become an important focus for us. And more than just documenting some of the impacts, we've really tried to move into what do we do next? How do we mitigate or adapt to these changes? Next slide, please. And so we even have projects going on around the country, working with stakeholders to try and utilize risk pools, minimize bycatch. We're partnering with the Pacific Fisheries Management Council right now to lead a scenario planning process. And I know that's an important topic for the Mid-Atlantic as well. Uh, and in the Northeast, we have a project where we're trying to use similar information to what Vince just showed, using dynamic habitat and understanding environmental drivers, but actually trying to get that information directly into the stock assessments, into the management itself. This is a project that's being led by Brian Greaves. So if there's really technical questions, I'll divert you to him. And, uh, but I'm the one presenting today. Next slide, please. And so with our species distribution models, these have certainly become, uh, there's numerous papers out right now. Vince just showed a whole handful of papers that he personally has been part of. Uh, many of the presenters today will uh, be noting various aspects of this. And of course, where well, many of us use similar techniques uh, to develop these, it's really in the application and in the different variables we use to define the habitat uh, where they differ. And so we'll just really quickly walk through this. In the top left, you have some observations. So in this case, it's survey data. Collect that. Uh, in the bottom left, you can see we pick some habitat parameter, in this case, temperature, fit some type of curve to it to try and understand what the optimal habitat parameter for a particular species is. We can then map that in space and time onto observed data or collections of observed data that are contained in a model, like an ocean model. And then we can have our plot on the right, which is our predicted, in this case, thermal habitat. And from that, we can really track how habitat would change over time, uh, whether it's changed thus far and projected into the future. And so this is a really useful planning tool. It's good for anticipating how things might change and allows us to help prepare for it and also works is extremely valuable for management tools and for that kind of scenario planning and long-term planning uh, that is important for preparing both uh, businesses, fishing industry, 
management and scientists on how things will change in the future. Our project, however, is really trying to take this thermal habitat and see how we can integrate it into the stock assessment itself. Next slide, please. Impetus for our project is that while things are changing on the long term, they're also changing on the daily to seasonal scale. So we have dynamic habitat in the ocean. Water is a just unbelievably powerful structuring agent. It basically defines where species can live, whether it's temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, all these things which change on a daily, weekly, seasonal, and decadal scale. They define whether species can be up in an estuary or offshore. And with many of our species on the Northeast Shelf, particularly the Mid-Atlantic, having onshore, offshore migrations uh, on a seasonal basis, it's important to understand how this habitat uh, impacts their movement and where they're distributed. So we have this plot of temperature in the middle here. And as we all are quite aware, some years spring comes early, some years spring comes late, some years are warm years, some years are cold years. And so that is not a fixed thing, but things change. And so species are responding to the seasonal signal, moving onshore and offshore, potentially with temperature and other variables which direct them throughout the season. On top of that, the backbone of our management system in the Northeast is stock assessments. And those stock assessments are very largely based on fisheries independent draw surveys. Those surveys present a huge amount of information, some of the most data rich areas in the entire world, but they go out and they're sampling. So it's important to just at least ask the question of whether how well they're actually sampling. These surveys go out roughly around the same time each year, but it's not the same time every year. Sometimes they're early, sometimes they're late, and it has changed a little bit over time. And of course, even if they did go out at the exact same time, the season is not changing precisely on the same day every year. So our impetus was trying to see if we could understand the potential for habitat-deviated observation error. Is there a match or mismatch between when we're sampling for fish, or fish and the resource and when the species might actually be present? Uh, this work is largely based on John Manderson and Josh Goet and others who did this work around butterfish. Next slide, please. On top of the dynamic habitat, we're also including some static habitat. Uh, this is important for some species. It's not important for other species. Certainly, some of the pelagic ones don't really care about what's on the bottom, but many of the ground fish and flatfish do have uh, some characteristics that supply where they need to, what type of habitat they need to be considered associated with. And so we want to take much more of a landscape view of this. While many previous studies have looked at kind of pixel by pixel, what's the slope in this particular area, we want to understand, you know, if you were looking at a mountain or grassland or a forest, what does that look like? And so for us, we're trying to think of what does the habitat actually entail? Is it a valley? Is it a peak? Is it flat areas? Are there depth contours that matter? Are there sediment on top of that? So we can map out actual patch areas across the entire northeast shelf from the mid-Atlantic all the way up into the Gulf of Maine, identify their size, how they're distributed, are they long and thin, are they compact, and try and understand all that information to see getting a better view of what the animal is actually recognizing and responding to, as opposed to a simple uh, statistic you might get from a multi-beam sonar or something. Next slide, please. So when we put that all together, like many of the studies, we get a habitat suitability index. We get an estimate of where we think the highest quality habitat for a particular species is. So here's an example of windowpane flounder. Uh, these are preliminary results. Uh, but you can see how the habitat is not changing on decadal kind of climate scale. We're really changing on a daily to weekly scale. In the top left is our suitable windowpane habitat for March 19, 1981. This is one day, and so we're looking at that. And windowpane flounder tend to like colder water temperatures. They like shallow water, more sandy habitat, and they tend to be in kind of flat areas or even some of the peaks, but they tend to avoid valleys. So what you can see is that the habitat is in March on the top left. Uh, it's largely in through Chesapeake Bay, New Jersey, Delaware, and hasn't made it that far north quite yet. Now, I'm not sure about you, but I'm probably really rare to see a window pane flounder in Chesapeake Bay. And so while this is optimal habitat for this particular day, it only takes a couple weeks before the temperature warms up 
and the probability of catching a window pane flounder in Chesapeake Bay goes to about zero. And you can see that in the middle plot there, in April, the habitat has now moved north, the waters around Long Island Sound are highly uh, suitable, and around southern New England. And then by May, in the final plot on the right, uh, you can see that the waters have warmed up a little bit, and so the, the yellow and kind of greenish colors, uh, the maximum suitable habitat is really a little bit further offshore, the shallowest water where the water temperature has still appropriate. So we can build these maps, and you know, these are that's lovely, great. Uh, but what we're trying to do is understand the total area of suitable habitat and how that compares to the footprint of the sampling device, typically the trawl survey. And so we take the suitable habitat on a daily basis, match that with the footprint of the trawl survey on the same day, understand that dynamic to try and figure out the availability of each species to the trawl survey. And that's how we account for this habitat-mediated observation error. It's not capturing the entire environment or an ecosystem, but it's one way to potentially get that information into the uh, dock at the so if you go to the next slide, please. So we have here this plot in the middle. This is year on the x-axis. And on the y-axis is our availability index. So this shows how available window pane flounder have been to the trawl survey over time. And what you can see is that it is variable, but there's no long-term trends. So in general, uh, window pane flounder has been pretty available to the trawl survey. And you can see the numbers are around 0 0.8, 0 0.9. So it's pretty high. So this trawl survey is actually capturing window pane pretty well. There's no major concerns here. Some variability which could be included, but it's not like there's a huge spike going up or going down or something like that. Now, the reason this is important is because the survey index is multiplied by a catchability factor. And that's how you turn an index of abundance into an estimate of total biomass, which then affects catch rates and referencing and things like that. Catchability has two components. One is availability and one is detectability. So what we're trying to do is figure out an actual empirical way to estimate availability, which can then go into this equation and then potentially influence docking. And so we don't know if it's vital. We don't know if it's an important consideration, but we think it's a question worth asking. And so we're working through 25 species to estimate the availability through this habitat suitability index uh, and to see if this is important for species and also to try and understand ecological implications uh, for these different habitat variables on the species. So if you want to go to the last slide. So with that, I just want to thank uh, a number of people who have been extremely instrumental uh, in this. John Manderson, Dave Richardson, and Eureka are all part of the project. And of course, all the many countless people who have collected all this information, uh, curated it, and provided their data. Those sort of things. So thank you. And I'll stick around later for any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Rich. Um, so our next speakers up are Tori Kentner and Chris Hack. Um, they're both currently working on the Northeast Regional Habitat Assessment. Tori is a habitat modeler, marine spatial ecologist that's working with NOAA through integrated statistics. She's worked on wind energy issues, marine protected areas, remote sensing, and 3D modeling of rocky intertidal zones in the past. Chris did his doctoral work at UMass Amherst studying tropical fish in um, tropical flats ecosystems. Um, he's really interested in the way species interactions scale up to shape communities, and he's now a postdoc with NOAA and the Urban Coast Institute. Um, Tori and Chris, you ready to go? I sure am. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here today and talk about the Northeast Regional Habitat Assessment. So this is a joint effort between many organizations. On this slide, you can see that our project leads come from the Mid-Atlantic and New England Fisheries Management Councils, Monmouth University, and NIMS. However, this is just a small list of everybody involved in this project. So the goal of the Northeast Regional Habitat Assessment is to describe and characterize estuarine, coastal, and offshore fish habitat distributions, abundance, and quality in the Northeast using a partnership-driven approach. Our geographic scope runs across the Northeast US from Maine to North Carolina, and we're covering both inshore and offshore regions. Our assessment covers over 65 focused species that have been deemed important by managers of the region. Next slide. 
So we're currently wrapping up the data identification and collection phase of this project. We've conducted an in-depth data inventory to assess the availability of data, both inshore and offshore. Work is also underway to build single species and joint models to assess habitat use of our 65 species. Our goals, as seen on this slide, are to assess the abundance and trends in habitat type in the inshore regions, spatially describe species habitat use in the offshore, apply climate models to predict habitat climate vulnerability, and then also apply our analyses to create visualizations that can support decision making. Next slide. OK, so what you see here is an example of our metadata pages. So while we were compiling a list of data sources, we, re we realized it might be really useful to create what we're calling a data library so that future projects and habitat modelers can build on the efforts with our, our efforts without needing to repeat the initial data search. So this is what the data library will look like. We're creating these one-page metadata snapshots for each data source with all the relevant information a user would need to know about at a glance. So this includes things like the date ranges, the data type, the resolution, if it's available online for download, or if you need to contact someone. At the bottom there, you can see the data access. And so this is where you can find those data links or links to the project page, contact information for the data manager. So in case you have any questions or data requests, you have their contact information right there available. It also, you can see, they all have a geographic range, so it describes the geographic range and also has a map. There's an overview that gives some kind of introductory information about the data, and then a methodology. So these, so these metadata, what we're hoping to do is put them together into a data library. And then hopefully we want to host them on one of the ocean data portals, like the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Data Portal. So that way they can be easily accessed by future researchers. We have about 40 of these pages created to date, and we're adding more regularly. And really the hope is that this data library can continue to grow and so future researchers can access it, they can see what data is available, and kind of quickly assess, is it useful to me? Is it cover my spatial range? Is it the resolution that I need? And hopefully it, solves, it saves a lot of um, time for future researchers. So I'll turn the talk over now to Chris so he can cover the joint models that we're developing for the NRHA. Hi, everyone. Um, so you guys have all heard a lot about species distribution models already, so I'm not going to go over too much of that again. Um, but uh, one, one of the things that makes what we're doing a little bit different is we're trying to, in addition to getting single species models, um, looking at a, trying to, uh, taking a so somewhat bigger picture approach um, and looking at joint models. So. Traditionally, single species models are like the, you know, the presentations or bonds to a suite of environmental predictor variables, uh, water temperature, salinity, benthic habitat characteristics, um, things like that. However, um, fish don't live in a vacuum. Species are, don't live amongst only themselves. Um, they share space. They share habitat. Um, they interact. They compete for resources or space. Um, and they even eat each other, right? So, um, and these interactions, in addition to to the environmental predictor variables, like as that we discussed, um, these interactions can also manifest themselves in in they can influence species distribution theoretically, um, causing, for example, predators or prey to attract or repel each other. Um, competitors can exclude each other, um, things like that. So theoretically, these interactions can be evident um, in species distributions uh, in the form of kind of positive or negative associations between species um, in space and time. Uh, next slide, please. So this is, again, where joint models come in. Um, they kind of acknowledge that these interactions occur and they try to account for them um, by modeling the distributions of several species at the same time. Um, to accomplish this, they, they not only estimate species relationships 
with environmental parameters the way a traditional FPM does, but they simultaneously estimate species patterns of covariance with one another. Um, in other words, do species A and B tend to co-occur more frequently or less frequently than one might expect by chance given their environmental preferences? Um, so joint, in doing this, joint models can kind of leverage these patterns of covariation to produce, theoretically again, produce uh, better predictions of species relationships with environmental parameters by untangling the effects of these species, by untangling their environmental niche from the disentangling it from that, from the effect of interaction. Um, and at the same time can leverage those interactions or the, those covariance patterns to improve predictions of habitat use for species that are rare or that don't really show uh, strong relationships with, those, with environmental parameters. Um, next slide, please. And then further complicating all this is the fact that the, the niche of, of a given species um, is not um, in, set in stone over, the individu over an individual's lifetime. Um, as, as an individual grows or develops, um, their ecological requirements can change, their abilities can change, their body size changes, um, so bigger things can eat bigger things, they can swim faster, they can um, avoid, they can avoid predators um, better or they grow out of, um, they outgrow predators. Um, and all those things can result in um, habitat shifts or diet shifts um, over time for a given individual as they grow. So different life stages um, as we all know, often use different habitats as um, juveniles often sometimes use inshore habitats and then, or estuaries and migrate to deeper waters uh, as they mature, things like that. Um, some species even shift, you know, shift their foraging gills as they, as they mature, um, being invertebrates, um, to even fish So those things, there's, can trying to account for these things in our models, um, we're partitioning life stages of these species, of each species into, partitioning each species into multiple life stages um, to try and both better capture um, the, any habitat shifts or differences in habitat use um, that occur over ontogeny. Um, for example, you know, if, if juveniles use a a distinct habitat from adults, then you pool them all. Your the picture you're going to get of, of their niche is going to be inaccurate. Um, so by breaking things up, we can hopefully get a better picture of these different niches, of different life stages, and at the same time, better capture the effect of interactions between life stages. Because as um, again, as as niches shift, species interactions can also shift. So if species B and species A um, compete as adults, they, it's po entirely possible that um, the juveniles of species B consume species A. So they're going to have different, theoretically different patterns, different relationships, and different, co different patterns of covariation in space and time. So by breaking them down into these smaller subgroups, um, we can hopefully do a better job of resolving um, both habitat shifts, but also um, species interactions with one another, putative interactions. Uh, next slide, please. So where is this all going? Um, this stuff can obviously become quickly, become very complex and overwhelming um, and computationally unfeasible. So to try and get around that, we're trying to develop multiple models, um, breaking down species and life stages into subgroups and model subgroups of species that are likely to interact or that share similar environmental drivers um, based on broad scale kind of habitat use patterns, whether they're offshore or inshore species um, or functional considerations, like whether they use the, the benthic habitats or, or exist in the water column. 
Um, and hopefully out of all this, we'll be able to get essentially what the nice thing about this is you get community level predictions um, of, of rather than single species predictions um, to a more holistic view of, of where things are going. Um, and with that, I will pass it along. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, thanks to Chris and Tori. Uh, our next speaker is Emily Farr. She works for the NOAA Fisheries Office of Habitat Conservation in Silver Spring. She's one of three co-leads on the Northeast Habitat Climate Vulnerability Assessment, along with Mark Nelson and Mike Johnson. Um, are you ready to go, Emily? Yes, thanks. Go ahead. Great. Um, next slide, please. Great, so I'm gonna talk about this Northeast Regional, sorry, yeah, Northeast um, Habitat Climate Assessment Project that um, we're working on. And the objective of this project overall is to provide regional fisheries habitat and protected species managers and scientists, and I would add ocean planners as well, uh, with a practical tool to efficiently assess the relative vulnerability of habitat to climate change. And we're focused on the region from Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, up to the border with Canada. Uh, and we're looking at riverine, estuarine, and marine habitats to capture the full range of habitats that NOAA's trust species rely on. Next slide, please. So this project is joining a growing toolbox of vulnerability assessments. There was a fish and shellfish assessment completed in 2016 led by John Hare, um, which informed a community fishing community assessment um, that was led by Lisa Colburn. And then there's an ongoing marine mammal and sea turtle climate vulnerability assessment that Matt Lettrick is leading at NOAA. Um, and all of these assessments aren't replacing these more quantitative and some fine scale um, climate models and um, species distribution models that we've heard about earlier that provide more of that nuance and geographic specificity, but they were really important tools to help us identify some of the drivers of vulnerability, um, highlight some key information gaps and, and priorities for action. So both the species and marine mammal vulnerability assessments included habitat as a minor component that influenced their vulnerability, but didn't fully account for the habitat vulnerability to climate change in and of itself. And so that's really what we're doing here. Uh, next slide, please. So we're looking at 52 different habitats based on a sort of modified Cowardin classification system. Um, a small subset of those are represented here just to give you an idea of how we've classified things. Um, so we have divisions between different habitats in each of these three systems, so things like rocky bottom, mud, sand, kelp, um, shellfish reefs. And then we have some further geographic divisions. So in the marine environment, um, these habitats are broken up between uh, intertidal, near shore, and offshore. In the estuarine between subtidal and intertidal, and in the riverine between um, tidal and non-tidal. In a couple of cases, we've split the habitats up by um, between New England and the Mid-Atlantic, but for the most part, we're looking at each of these habitats and their climate vulnerability over the full range, um, the full region. Next slide, please. So the approach that we're taking is looking at vulnerability based on two components, sensitivity and exposure. So sensitivity is looking at attributes of the habitats that are indicative of their response to changes in the climate. So things like their current condition, fragmentation, whether they can spread or disperse, how resistant or resilient they are. And we're really focused on attributes that are relevant for climate change, but we're also considering uh, sensitivity to non-climate stressors as one of our factors. So things like dredging, shoreline hardening, offshore development. Since we know that habitats that are sensitive to these anthropogenic stressors will also be more vulnerable to climate change. The exposure component is looking at climate variables that could impact the habitat. So that includes temperature, salinity, pH, precipitation, um, stream flow, stream temperature, and sea level rise. Next slide, please. So in order to assess 
the sensitivity. So this whole approach is based on expert elicitation, which means that it relies on expert knowledge to score both the sensitivity and exposure of each habitat, in addition to published literature and climate projection information. So for the sensitivity scoring, we had an in-person workshop earlier this year with 15 different habitat experts. Um, we provided them with a summary of literature about each habitat relevant to those sensitivity attributes that were listed on the previous slide and ask them to distribute scores between low, moderate, high, and very high sensitivity based on um, some predefined scoring bins. Uh, next slide, please. And so for the exposure side of the analysis, um, this was done virtually with a smaller group of scorers, and we're relying on um, end of century projections under the RCP 8.5 or business as usual scenario. Um, as well as data sets of the distribution of each habitat throughout the range. And essentially what we're doing is comparing the habitat distribution information with those climate projections for each exposure factor. So here you have sea surface temperature um, and marine and estuarine mud. Um, and the scorers are also, again, binning by low, moderate, high, or very high exposure um, based on this difference between the projected future and the historic mean for each of these exposure factors. Um, and so then the exposure and sensitivity components are combined to give us the vulnerability for each habitat. Next slide, please. So this is a high level look at our preliminary results. I know it might be a little hard to read, I'm sorry about that. Um, I just wanna note that these are in draft, so we're currently doing some tweaks and changing our analysis a little bit. Um, but I wanted to highlight a couple of things here. Um, you can see up in the right corner, uh, upper right corner, um, most of the very high or highly vulnerable habitats tend to be those living habitats. So deep sea coral and sponge, wetlands, FAV, oyster reefs, for example. Um, another thing to note is that estuarine habitats generally scored a little bit higher vulnerability than their marine counterparts. Um, where and water column and benthic habitats tended to score a little bit lower. Uh, next slide, please. So that was a really high level look at the relative vulnerability rankings. Um, and one of the things that we're working on to drill down a little bit deeper for each habitat is these habitat narratives. And so these are showing the specific um, sensitivity and exposure scores for each of those variables for each habitat, accompanied by a description of what are really the key drivers of the vulnerability score, um, how are we expecting climate to impact this habitat, um, and highlighting where there might be some um, data or information gaps that we might want to look further into in the future. Next slide, please. So I wanted to touch a little bit on how we anticipate this assessment to be used. Um, and first, a few um, of the kind of fisheries-focused applications. So we've been working really closely with the Northeast Regional Fish Habitat Assessment work that Tori and Chris just presented on, um, and working to make sure that our results are incorporated into their more spatial products um, at the end of that project. We're also um, working to integrate these results into the state of the ecosystem reports that um, the Northeast Fisheries Science Center with NOAA puts out every year um, to help inform the councils in particular, um, as well as informing the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council's ecosystem approach to fisheries management work, um, specifically um, informing their risk assessment um, annual updates, which help guide some of their ecosystem system approach um, decision making. Um, we also anticipate that this will be helpful for informing essential fish habitat consultations, um, as well as sort of looking ahead some updates to essential fish habitat designations or habitat areas of particular concern. Um, and then one of the things that we're starting to think about is how do we link these habitat specific results with the fish and marine mammal and sea turtle vulnerabilities to really understand how does habitat vulnerability influence species vulnerability. Um, next slide, please. And so just a couple of thoughts about how this work might inform some broader regional ocean planning efforts. 
Um, I think it'll be really helpful for prioritizing areas for habitat conservation or restoration. Um, helping to provide some context for project setting, things like aquaculture or wind, um, just taking into account habitat vulnerability and where those habitats are located. Um, and then I think pretty useful in um, some NEPA analyses to really just provide long-term context for actions that impact habitat. Um, so just a couple of thoughts on how it might be more broadly useful. Um, next slide, I think my last slide. Great. So yeah, just want to note that a lot of people have been involved in this project, both within NOAA as well as other federal agencies and university partners and others. So it's been a huge team. So just wanted to make sure to acknowledge um, all the great contributions to this project. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, so for our last speaker, we have Jim Morley. He's an assistant professor at East Carolina University at the Coastal Studies Institute that's located on the North Carolina Outer Banks. He uses long-term fishery survey data to model species habitat use and to understand how population dynamics and species distributions respond to variations in climate, including forecasts of climate change impacts. Um, Jim, are you ready to go? Yep, I'm ready. OK, all um, yours. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks for having me. Um, this has been a very uh, informative meeting for me as well. Um, it's a very rapidly moving field, and there's a lot of exciting work going on in this area of the country. Uh, today I'm talking about work that I'm involved with that is forecasting changes in species habitat in the coming century, similar to what we've been hearing about. Although, more specifically, I'm going to be talking about the sources of uncertainty with these projections and um, a way to incorporate that uncertainty. And um, this work has involved a, a number of different people. Uh, most, probably most intensively would be uh, Malin Pinsky um, at Rutgers and Thomas Froelicker at, at the University of Bern. Uh, next slide, please. So you've seen uh, different versions of this slide already. Um, so. I use fishery survey data, like a lot of the other folks today, um, from bottom trawls um, in the Northeast and other areas of the country to make statistical models of species habitat preference, um, which here I'm calling a niche model. This is an example with yellow-tailed flounder. Um, on the left, you can see the catch locations for this species from five different bottom trawl surveys in the U.S. and Canada. Um, there's some gaps in there where the sampling doesn't occur. Um, and based on that data, we, we developed these habitat models, these niche models. And the, on the right side there, you can see an example of the projected habitat of this species. So this is where the species is modeled to occur based on the observations. And hopefully these two figures um, are similar to each other in most cases. And um, we use metrics like the centroid, which many people are probably familiar with, which is an indicator of the geographic center of a species distribution. And metrics like that are handy just to track historical change in species distribution and to uh, measure um, future impacts. Next slide. So using habitat models, we've already done a lot of work projecting shifts in distribution. We've done it for hundreds of species all over North America. Um, and this is sort of a summary of that for a, a high carbon emissions future. These are all species that we seem to have low uncertainty. Each arrow represents a different species. And what's being shown is the, the, the projected future um, distance and direction that a species centroid is going to shift. Um, and, but from now, for the rest of my time today, I'm going to talk about uncertainty, the uncertainty that goes along with these uh, projected shifts. And I'll be using an example from a, a recent analysis we've completed. Um, next slide. So I'm going to, I'll build on this diagram over a few slides. It's, it's, I'm trying to illustrate the sources of uncertainty with these types of projections. Um, so uh, one major source of uncertainty is we don't really know precisely how um, ocean climate is going to change. We don't know how warm the oceans are going to get. Um, to capture that uncertainty um, for this exercise, we've pulled together um, databases for, um, to generate 54 different future climates that we're working with. 
and we are using two different levels of uncertainty with these with these futures. Um, the first is with um, different RCPs, and, and hopefully you're familiar with these. These are um, different um, ways to anticipate the human response in the future, and put, I guess most simply, you could look at them as um, different amounts of carbon concentrations in the atmosphere. So 2.6 would represent um, less global warming, and 8.5 would represent the most global warming. And within each of these RCPs, we are using 18 climate simulation models. So these are just different um, modeling groups from around the world that um, have used slightly different methods to represent the Earth climate system and, and these simulations uh, generate predictions of future climates. So with this, we've developed this database of 54 future climates. Um, next slide. So in addition to uncertainty with climate, there's uncertainty in the biology of the system. So, and here we're looking at uncertainty that's associated with different ways to statistically represent a species' um, environmental preferences. And we're using four different types of niche models. There's really probably an infinite um, variety of niche models you could um, put together, but we're just trying to encapsulate it with these four. And within each of those fours, we're gener we've generated 40 um, submodels. And, and each of these submodels basically um, encapsulates a range of uncertainty that goes within one single niche model. Um, and so next slide, if you do the math there, we, we combine these in every possible way to generate for each species um, over 8,000 annual future um, projections. And this, again, these this captures a full range of possible future outcomes and each each and representing all these different approaches that one might take each one is potentially um, plausible we've done this with seven species but I'm just using a couple examples today um, summer flounder being the main one next slide please um, so this is output for summer flounder um, on the left we're showing output um, from the present time period, which is the, the gray cloud farthest to the left, and four future time periods. And each one of these gray <laughs> shapes is showing a data distribution and is showing those 8,000 plus potential future centroid values at each future time period. So again, this represents the range of possible outcomes for summer flounder, depending on what modeling approach you're taking. On the right, the bars are, are corresponding to each of those five time periods, and they're showing what, what factors are responsible for um, the uncertainty that we see in the left, in, the, in those gray distributions. So we're looking at the parameter uncertainty within niche models, uncertainty associated with carbon emissions, that's RCP, uh, uncertainty in the orange um, associated with the climate model, so the general circulation model, and then the niche model in blue. And these results vary by species, but with summer flounder, you can see that the climate model, that GCM in orange, is really the dominant source of uncertainty um, in these projections. So the, the take home here is the climate model makes a big difference, which climate model you use in the output that you're gonna get for species. Um, and for summer flounder, also the niche model was, was pretty important. So if you use a different niche model, you might get um, very different results. So how do we, uh, knowing this information, how do we um, generate robust projections to uncertainty? Next slide, please. Um, so what we've done with this exercise is create a, a multi-model um, projection for these, these seven different species. And we basically average together the, eight, the output from the 18 different climate simulation model, models. That way, um, the projection isn't overly sensitive to any one climate model. And we also use six different modeling approaches, including GAMs and GLMs and boosted regression trees. And we weight the contribution of each of those niche models based on some indicator of, of performance to give a, sort of a, a more robust um, uh, projection. And these maps are showing end of the century, high carbon emission situation, um, the red is indicating a loss of habitat suitability, and the blue is indicating an increase in habitat suitability. And you can the, you can see the patterns there, pretty major patterns, um, especially for lobster. 
Um, so, um, next slide, please. So, work in progress. Um, we're going to going to generate these um, uh, multi-model uh, ensemble projections for all the managed species in the country, um, and package them in sort of a user-friendly way. And this is an example. This isn't a a final result, but this is for the, these are Mid-Atlantic Council managed species. And and what we hope to um, provide with this is basically, it's kind of a species ranking. You know, these are, it's an index of potential climate impacts. And, and with the Mid-Atlantic here, um, you know, it's, uh, the species in this region um, are projected to fare fairly, uh, fare pretty well, um, but this pattern is certainly not true for other species or other regions. Um, and the last slide, please. Um, just to summarize what I've said, uh, multi-model approaches I think are going to be a valuable tool that incorporate um, uncertainty and projections. Um, and one thing I didn't mention is this approach is especially important, I think, with um, studies that are modeling many species at once. You know, when you're modeling potentially hundreds of species, which is going to be a valuable tool for fisheries management considering the number of species involved, um, there's going to be a lot of these automated approaches to modeling. So I think these, these ensemble approaches help um, get around that lack of um, TLC that a, a single uh, individual species study might have. Um, and finally, what I didn't really get into, but the outcomes really do vary within regions. The Mid-Atlantic region, um, there is largely a uh, beneficial outcome potentially, but other regions like in New England, it was the opposite trend. And um, positive or negative, all regions are really going to be anticipate should anticipate really major changes, which is going to be challenging. Um, that's it. All right, thank you, Jim. Um, well, that was our last uh, presentation, so I'm going to go ahead right now and hand um, control back to um, Carl here. Stop sharing my screen. All right, so what we wanted to do next, um, because we've had these really excellent presentations, I know it's been a lot of great informa information um, for our webinar participants. Um, we drafted a few questions ahead of time, um, and we wanted to poll our participants to see what they'd like to hear the presenters and this, this panel discuss. So we're just going to take um, maybe two, three minutes. If folks on the webinar could go ahead and um, choose two questions that you might like to hear the panel discuss, and then we'll, um, we'll close the poll and we'll go ahead and pose those questions to our panelists. All right. Um, well, Carl, uh, I think we've we've waited a couple minutes. It looks like it's the poll has slowed down a bit. Um, do you want to go ahead and close it? Okay. So the poll's closed. So the top question there was, what are some of the biggest challenges and opportunities that shifting fish species will bring? Um, so I'm I'm going to toss that out, um, uh, Vince. 
Uh, what are some of your thoughts? And we can um, have some of the other panelists jump in as well. Oh, uh, sure. Can, can you still hear me okay, Jessica? I can. You sound great. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so from my perspective, uh, you know, working for NOAA um, in both the fisheries and the climate modeling uh, components, for me it's mostly the management is, is the biggest challenge. Um, we're, we're seeing shifts on the order of, you know, annual timescales. And um, I think it's been quite a challenge for uh, fisheries management to keep up with these really quick, rapid changes. Um, because there's, there's two sides of the infrastructure that we have to think about, both the, the marine side, so, you know, fishing boats actively going out, spending fuel, um, you know, considering their gear types for their target species. But there's also the land infrastructure as well. I think summer flounder is probably uh, one of the better examples that I can think of where most of the land infrastructure for processing is in the southern portions of the U.S. Northeast and less so in the north. And um, that's a huge implication for changing quotas um, geographically as these stocks are shifting. And so obviously our job at NOAA is to, uh, you know, provide management with the best possible uh, science to uh, allow them to make these decisions. But one thing that we've been challenged with as a scientific community has been the uh, lack of ocean forecasts. And so everything that you saw today uh, from Jim's talk and the other talks, my own talk, uh, we're using long-term projections, which I think are still relevant for long-term fishery management plans, but not relevant for year-to-year -year tactical management decisions. And in order to make those decisions based on changing conditions, you know, we're, we're really in need of these short-term ocean forecasts, which we are trying to improve, um, at least within NOAA, in terms of our re regional modeling capabilities. And so, at least speaking in terms of the U.S. Northeast, the forecasting skill for ocean conditions, conditions is very, very poor in this region because it's a very complicated uh, oceanic region to model. So I think those are the two top, the top two for me, the, the management side, but also the forecasting side in terms of the modeling. All right, thanks, Vince. How about you, Jim? What do you think on that topic? Well, uh, feeding off of what Vince said, um, you know, a lot of the modeling and the projection modeling we do is you know, utilizing this niche model approach where we see this species is occupying this particular set of environmental conditions. But I think as we get into trying to make shorter term predictions that might be driven by climate, um, I really think that understanding the, the true mechanisms behind the shifts are going to be a lot more important. So, um, and a lot of times, you know, you think that this, the species is just kind of swimming actively to new areas that are more favorable, but perhaps more often than not, it's changes in local productivity of a species. You know, a, a given estuary is becoming less productive for a species, and, and a lot of times those are the things that are driving the shifts, and I think it's going to be important to really understand some of those mechanisms to try to make short-term forecasts. Interesting. Um, so uh, I guess uh, Tori, Chris, Rich, or Emily, do you guys have any follow-on thoughts? This is Rich. I have a couple thoughts. I'll say you know, one of the major challenges, as was pointed out, is that our management, sort of the industry and some of the science are really based on the status quo, the idea that things would not be changing. So we set our management advice based on stock assessments uh, that think that there will be variability, but it will be around some kind of central mean. And so that presents huge challenges with allocation, with things shifting, with where you build processors and how that all shifts around. And what I see is a potential opportunity that will take a good amount of work and effort and there will be some serious growing pains. With that, though, is that as we recognize now that these things are really changing, that we can morph the system into recognizing that. And so when we think about how to plan infrastructure, port infrastructure processes, to recognize that things may be very considerably and may move north and may move south within a season or within a decade time period. We plan FMPs, we plan how to divide management boundaries so we can actually think about long-term plans and not just set allocation based on his historical data but actually consider what would happen if things change in the future. And so developing a system, doing some planning, using much of the information that's available on the portals and things like that, we can actually create a system that would be more dynamic and be able to respond to this.
Yeah, this is Emily. I was I was going to put an opportunity in the mix and build sort of on what Rich said. I think that climate change sort of forces us to think about these mechanistic relationships and ecological interactions, and I think provides an opportunity to bring more of that dynamic information into the management system and think more creatively and um, maybe bring in new kinds of information, new kinds of knowledge that we might not have considered um, as, as robustly um, in fisheries management and ocean management in the past. And so I think it's an opportunity to bring in some new knowledge, bring in some new information and um, think more ecologically. Yeah, thanks, Emily. Um, you know, I'm going to kind of jump down to the next question on the list. Um, the second question that polled was, what advice might, might you have for citing offshore wind structures in the face of this dynamic ecosystem and shifting species? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and ask um, Tori and Chris uh, if you guys want to start us off with that one. Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure, I can jump in on that. So something I've been really interested in looking at is how the wind structures and the areas around them could work as sort of marine reserves. So I've heard that wind energy areas will likely be closed to fishing or at least have restricted fishing. And so in a way, it could potentially provide some resilience, resiliency to fishing effects or a refuge for those fish that are in that area. So some, there's been some research that wind turbines may provide like a hard bottom substrate, so potentially could increase habitat for hard bottom species like black sea bass, for example, that might spill over into outside fishing grounds. So I'd be really interested in looking more into how wind structures might potentially impact fish and invertebrate populations. Yeah, other thoughts from the group on that one? Um, this is Jim, uh, and I don't know a tremendous amount about, uh, you know, the ecological impacts of these structures, but um, an important consideration in this area um, is, you know, North Carolina is representing this major biogeographic break, and the, the benthic habitat between these two areas is, is quite a bit different, and there's still a lot of uncertainty over the ability of a lot of these, the southeast species to uh, move northward, and if the, the, the correct type of bottom is going to be there, um, I think that's going to be an important uh, goal for future research. But the idea of um, wind farms potentially providing structured habitat for species like that, especially um, species moving into that area, is a, a compelling um, idea and it definitely would be uh, worth exploring. So this is Rich. The, certainly, you know, citing offshore wind farms is uh, an important consideration and one of those aspects that really lends itself to marine spatial planning, trying to understand all the different constraints and all the different user groups that might uh, want to use a particular space or a particular resource. Uh, and certainly, there's some work going into that right now, uh, developing kind of long-term plans using information, some of these projections to get some kind of reasonable expectation about how things might change in the future. And accounting for that while you're doing your planning right now is certainly an important aspect. Uh, I think groups like uh, Rhode Island in general, with their ocean stamp, did a good job of actually doing some fundamental research prior to even opening up areas for leases. So they knew they had some of the stakeholders, not all of them, but some of the stakeholder con uh, concerns out of the way. They identified where highly productive areas would be, where biodiversity might be constrained, where vulnerable habitat would be. But considering these aspects, and making sure you account for them when citing those wind farms where they would be, and even within the lease blocks themselves. I think that's really important. And so doing that work up front and ensuring you have the data to actually do that, the long time series, uh, the buoy data, all the biological information is essential for being able to plan that and cite them efficiently and well and be able to try to minimize conflicts between these two. Any other last thoughts from the presenters on this on this question with wind sighting? Okay. 
Um, what, I, what I'd like to do with the last few minutes that we have available, um, we'd like to just open it up to the webinar participants. Um, I'm sure after seeing all of your talks, there are some questions um, that folks would like to ask. So if anyone has a question that they'd like to ask our presenters, if they could just type those in the box, and we'll just sort of open it up for these last few minutes. All right, I see a number of folks are typing, um, so we'll, we'll take these as they, as they come. Okay, let's see. Okay, so one of the questions that came in from Eric in um, the chat box was, he was curious about the near 0% projected change in thermal habitat for Atlantic mackerel. Is that because they've already shifted further north into New England? Um, so I think that would be directed to you, Vince. Is that? Um, I, I don't think I showed mackerel, no. Oh, you didn't? No, you were scouts and lobster. Who had mackerel? Um, was that? I, I, I slide of mackerel, yeah, so the 0% projected change in thermal habitat um, in one of my figures. Um, I'll do my best to answer that without looking at the actual projection map. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but this is going to the middle of the century. Um, and mackerel did have a slight decline. But um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'm guessing there's probably substantial redistribution of of their habitat space according to the model distribution. But I'd, if you're um, interested specifically in that species, I'm happy. If you uh, reach out, email me. I'm happy to share the distribution, the projected distribution map. Sure. Well, we can make sure that um, all the talks and your emails are available at the end, um, uh, are available to all the, the participants um, after this uh, webinar. Um, so Eric can go ahead and then um, shoot you an email on that. So another question we have coming in, so are uh, subsurface or benthic water temperatures factored into these climate models? Are temperatures in deeper water expected to trend warmer to the same degree as surface waters? Um, does someone want to tackle that? Um, this is Vince. Yeah, I mean, I think the results, at least what I showed, I think what Jim showed and and Rich, I believe all the all those studies are using three-dimensional ocean temperature. So, you know, cases where you're using surface for pelagic, bottom for demersals. Um, but in general, the projections, whether using a coarse climate model that Jim was showing or even a high-res one that I was showing, um, in, in, in both cases, the ocean is warming both in the surface and the bottom. It's just a different rate. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Vince. Um, one other question, and this might be a good one for Emily. Um, someone asked, uh, NOAA has a role in supporting commercial fisheries and protecting habitat, so how do you manage those conflicting requests? Sure, good question. Um, so a couple things. I mean, I think one is protecting habitat and supporting commercial fisheries often goes hand in hand. Um, NOAA does a lot of work to protect, for example, nursery habitats that, or restore nursery habitats that are really important for sustaining commercial fisheries. Um, we do a lot of research and support a lot of research to understand the relationship between nursery habitats and other habitats and offshore fish productivity. And so a lot of the time, it's sort of two sides of the same coin, I would say. Um, in terms of protecting habitat, um, there's other ways um, that that's, there's a lot of ways that um, approaches to that, a couple of things like deep sea coral protections or um, gear restrictions on certain sensitive habitats. Um, there's um, essential, the essential fish habitat consultation process, where if there's large, if there's projects that um, are impacting fish habitat, they go through this consultation process to minimize those impacts. So um, sort of a lot, I think, sometimes protecting habitat is, is supporting commercial fisheries in a lot of ways, and, and, um, and sometimes there's sort of a balance there. 
So hopefully that answers the question a little bit. Yeah, I think that was really helpful. Um, we have, have another question. Um, given the large uncertainties around both climate models and the cumulative effects of offshore wind, how will we distinguish between the range of effects? Can we really dis distinguish the effects? Um, does someone want to take that one? Um, I, I can take a shot at it. This, this is Vince. I mean, that's a really good question, and I think you know, one thing that I propose, and I think some others um, in Europe have already done this, is to actually model um, the impacts of offshore wind in an ocean model um, that's fully coupled to the atmosphere and uh, to the ecosystem. Um, I don't think we've done that too much here in the U.S. I don't think we know enough about it. And I think in order to drive those models to look at the cumulative effects, we need to have more observations of these um, offshore wind structures on the ocean and the ecosystem to then inform the models. And so without those empirical observations, um, we're going to have a hard time at training the models and doing different scenarios, whether you're looking at, say, you know, two, three years out or 50 years out uh, in terms of modeling those cumulative effects because it's, it's, it's such a new thing. One other aspect on that is that uh, we have pretty good information or almost perfect information on exactly when wind farms and aspects like that are instituted. Uh, so right now there's five turbines total and we know exactly when they're going to affect. And so we are definitely seeing long-term trends in distribution, shifts in distributions and changes in productivity of fish species and other marine taxa throughout the northeast shelf. And so we're seeing those trends, which you can attribute many of them to certain aspects of warming water or other changes due to climate change. When it comes to wind farms, they certainly will have an impact on exactly what they will be. We can use some information from, say, Europe to do that. Uh, but we also know if we see a very punctuated change in the species, particularly in a localized area, if all the elasmobranchs suddenly leave around a wind farm or something, you know, we would know exactly when the data is. We'd know when that implementation was. And so we have a better idea of what the potential uh, reason for that, what the cause of that was. And so there are, just, there are some things we can attribute more to climate, some things we potentially can examine more further and see if there's potential for wind farm to have a big impact. Uh, and then there are some things we will have that cumulative effect, particularly as we have uh, large amounts, right? the plan is to have large amounts of wind farm on the whole east coast. Uh, so some things will be much more challenging to see. All right, thanks, Rich. And so I'm going to have this be our, our last question. Um, it's from Tony McDonald with the Urban Coast Institute. Um, Tony asks, so assuming you figure out all the ocean forecast challenges, how do we bring along the management, fishers, managed community um, to making regulatory and management decisions made based on these forecasts? And I think that also uh, relates to Mary Cammy's question, how do you suggest we share these complicated data and their implications with the public? Um, so any l last thoughts from, from our presenters on that? Well, in some cases, I think it's a lot like the weather forecast. When they first started out, uh, they weren't great, and you went outside with that umbrella no matter what. Uh, and as they improved, you had more faith in them, and so you started actually planning according to them. Uh, so as these people are certainly working on forecasts, uh, and they're, you know, some might be better than others, Certain regions are much easier to forecast than others, uh, just like the weather currently is. Uh, but it's about, it's a process, there's no question. And so we start with trying to do some longer term planning using the potential range of scenarios from these forecasts, these long term, you know, decadal scale forecasts that Jim and Vince had showed. And then as forecasts get better, we have more faith in them, then we start working those more into uh, some smaller scale or short term actual planning activities. And the important thing is that we want to have some kind of plan in place. Fisheries managed plans are designed to be able to understand the kind of range of scenarios that could happen and then account for them, what the regulation should be, how they should shift if certain things shift. We're now going to have to introduce this climate variable into those fisheries management plans, which was not, ex you know, might have been there to some extent, but was not explicitly a consideration and had not been used to any great extent. Uh, and so now we have to really include that in there and so understand what the changes might be, what actions we might want to take for different scenarios, uh, which is exactly how some of these planning processes are doing. 
can actually account for that. And so that is a, going to be an important component moving forward and actually getting the councils, getting state agencies and things to have the time and the resources to actually be able to plan moving forward, identify what the threshold should be, and then what steps they would need to take to actually mitigate some of those responses to how to do it. Uh, and so that's a process that we all need to actually engage in. And having the information available is an essential component. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, any any final pressing thoughts um, from any of our presenters? Well, look, um, I want to thank you all for coming and presenting um, to this uh, on this MACO webinar. We greatly appreciate your time and um, you sharing your expertise and. Um, working with the technology here as best as we can, wherever we all may be participating from. Um, really appreciate that. Um, I'd like to just hand it back to Kevin Hassel, just briefly, to close the meeting. Um, and also, Kevin, if you want to mention any upcoming um, webinar events that folks can tune into with MACO um, in the next few weeks. Thanks, Jessica. Um, yeah, again, I want to reiterate thanks for the panel that you had here. This was great, hugely informative, um, really highlights the complexity of all the work that's going on with this and, and how important getting this right is and, and just that shared constant collaboration across um, these multiple disciplines. So um, thanks everyone on that. I, um, we are um, coming up on some other webinars upcoming soon. We, we did have our resolution uh, forum last month. Um, there was issues with uh, the amount of people that were able to join, so we're actually going to do a follow-up of the, the kind of interactive sessions. Um, look for an email soon on that. Uh, that should be June 23rd. I think that's where we can nail down a time on that. Um, so if people can come back and actually have some um, discussions around some of the, the MAKO work areas and, and then other areas that we should collaborate on in the future. So kind of ties into some of the stuff that we talked about here on how we deal with these kind of issues. So um, with that, uh, I mean, I think that's it. I think it's been really been helpful. And, uh, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Um, Jessica, if there's anything else you want to say, please go ahead. But otherwise, um, thanks, everyone, um, and look forward to working with you all in the future, too. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. And just a big thanks to, thanks to all our presenters again. Um, really appreciate it. Have a good one. Take care, everyone.